Alwina Jesieniary, z tej strony do Męska Grówka, czyli ja, Pawła nie ma, jest Sak, jest Cześć. Weronika, jest Michał i jest John. Hi. E, jak słyszeliście, e, będzie dzisiaj trochę inaczej, bo dzisiaj będziemy rozmawiać też po angielsku. Będziemy ćwiczyć swoją umiejętności mówienia w języku innym niż polski. E, mamy ze sobą tłumacza. Mamy nadzieję, że pomoże nam się jakoś <grych> ogarnąć z tym językiem. E, a ja w tym momencie przejdę na język obcy, żeby troszeczkę zapoznać was z Johnem. E, so, John, tell us something about you. Okay, I'm. Uh, my name is John. I have actually five names. It's John, oh, wow. Jonathan, Philip, Eric, Paul. Ouch. So five names. So John is my first name. My surname is Paul. So many people ask me, okay. what is your surname? I say Paul. But Paul is a name. I say, yeah, but my father's surname is Paul. Yeah, so I have five surnames. And hmm. I come from Malaysia, from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And uh, I've been a banker. I've been I've been working in a bank for many years in Kuala Lumpur. But now I'm a full-time missionary. I've left my job and I've uh, dedicated my life for mission work to go around the world evangelizing, sharing my faith with people and my experience, my encounter with Jesus. So that's why I'm here today. I met your auntie in Halifax, then I met your father in Halifax and somehow God made everything possible for me to be here yeah. in, in Bialystok. So I'm very happy to be here. We are very happy that you are here with us. What it means to live a life like a missionary? What, what do you do in your everyday life? And what makes you go from, uh, I don't know, Malaysia uh, to Bialystok <laughs> and uh, to USA? How does it work? How listening to God in yeah. it works? So, the point, uh, the most important point is this calling, answering this call, yeah? When I, had, when I heard this voice in my heart, in the silence of my heart, I was thinking, is it, my, is it my voice or my desire or really God is talking to me? Of course, I have to get guidance. So I have to go and speak to my spiritual director. I have to go and speak to a priest and say, okay, I have this calling. I don't know whether it's from me or from God. So my spiritual director basically guided me to this point where he he, with both of us praying, and we came to this point, he said, he told me that yes, it is a calling from God, but you have to decide now what you want to do with this calling. We always have to make a decision what we want to do. The calling is always there, yeah? So he told me, you have to decide. So I prayed, and I told God, okay, if really this calling is from you, I need to tell this to my mother, if my mother said, go, go, if God is calling, go, then, you know, that means it's from you, yeah. So I went to tell my mother, so of course I told my mother, I was talking to her, and then, she, then of course she was shocked. She said, what? Because my mother was still thinking in the worldly form that, you know, you got a house, you got a, you got a apartment, you got a good job, you got a good salary, now you have everything. All I have to do is find a nice girl for you to get married and settle down. Every mother like that, no? Every, every mother. Every mother think, oh, when are you going to get married? When are you going to have grandchildren? Yeah. So my mother was the same. <laughs> yeah? But, uh, and then she, she was very sad and she was crying. She cried for three days. So I said, okay. So I told, okay, mom, leave it at this end. But then I brought into prayer. I said, God, really, if this is from you, then you have to do something with my mother. Because if she doesn't give me that blessing, that means I wouldn't go. Yeah. So after three days, this sense God said, okay, now it's time to go speak to your mother again. So I brought her out for dinner, we sat down, we had a meal, we were talking, and, and I started to share. I think my first mistake was I told her I'm going to resign and gonna do this. She got shocked. But on the second time when I spoke to her, I started to talk to her about what God is doing in me. There was two different way of approach, yeah? Mm -hmm. That how, what God was doing in my life, what God was doing, and how much joy I was experiencing doing what I was doing. And then she looked at me and she paused and she said, John, if God is calling you, then who am I to stop you? 
go. So when she said go, I of course felt afraid again because I had to leave my job. But after much, much prayer, I was ready to leave my job after 11 years. And I started my missionary journey in Australia for one year. I did my training in Australia for one year. And here in the community is where I learn about personal prayer time. As a missionary, that is the key. The personal relationship, my personal prayer time. Yes, I have community prayer, I have a mass, I have all these communal meetings. But in community, community taught me that your personal prayer time is the most important of all these prayers because it is your time, your uh, encounter with God personally. So from then on, I started building. So this, this was, as a missionary, it started with me, this personal relationship with God. And from there, God was opening different doors of missions, mm -hmm. putting different people in my path who was guiding me, leading me. So and I, I started to grow in the community in Australia. I started to grow in the community when I came to Poland. I joined this international community in Czestochowa mm -hmm. and I started to grow with them also. Yeah. So then from there, started to branch out to different parts of Europe as a missionary, to America, to South Korea, to New Zealand, to all these places as a missionary. I'm uh, speaking here and um, talking here about not, not um, um, missions uh, always, but about uh, the culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think for the people in Poland and or in Europe, the culture in Asia is something, uh, something exotic. Hard. <laughs> something exotic, something hard. And can you uh, tell us more about, uh, I think for me personally, this is the, the most interesting, uh, what it means to be a Catholic in Malaysia? Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you have uh, special traditions maybe there? Okay. And uh, something like that. I mean, we must first understand that Malaysia is a predominant Muslim country. Okay. Yeah. So Muslim is the dominant religion in Malaysia. Uh, and uh, Christianity is about 10% of the population. We have about 32 million uh, Malaysians, so the population is about 10% yeah, of the population. And out of this 10%, 5% is Catholic, the others are not a uh, Protestant okay. group. Yeah? So, so uh, as Christians living in a predominant Muslim countries, there's always challenges. <laughs> there's always challenges. Yeah? So there's always a difficulty. We live in unity, we live in harmony, yes, we do live in harmony, but there's certain restrictions for other religion in a Muslim-dominated country, yeah? So for example, I cannot share Jesus with a Muslim person. If I do share about Jesus to a Muslim person, I can be in prison, yeah? So, so, uh, how to, to evangelize the culture that is predominant Muslim. Yeah, so, so you have to find creative way to evangelize. Yeah? So what we do as young people in, in Malaysia, in, especially in communities or in prayer groups, yeah? people who are, very, uh, uh, who are very committed to their faith, we will use Christian t-shirts ah. with messages. You know? So we have Christian t-shirts in, in English or in our native language and we go to university with Christian t-shirts or we go to, to places in shopping malls, whatever, we have our Christian t-shirts, you know, message like Jesus died for you, he freed you from your sins and you know, so these are ways that we evangelize the culture. Okay. We understand. They are not having a problem with it? Like, no, no, they don't, because you're not speaking to them about Jesus. <laughs> wow. That's, yeah? that's nice. So, so they see, they see the message, they cannot tell you, take out your t-shirt, it's offending to me. No. This is my right, my t-shirt. I want to use whatever I want to use. He's using whatever he wants to use. Yeah, so, you know, because the Muslims in Malaysia also, they cover. I don't tell them, take this out because it's offending to me. Right? So, so you have to, uh, so that's how you evangelize the culture that you are in. Yeah. So, but for us in Malaysia, because we cannot speak the word of God to them, we cannot share the word of God with them, 
So we have we have come to this realization that we have to live the word of God in us. We have to live the gospel. We have to follow what Jesus says in the gospel. So we live the gospel. So we become walking Bibles for them. Nice. Yeah. So that's how you you learn. So that it did, so it's so from this experience of mine in Malaysia. So wherever I go in the world, if I go to India, then I live the gospel. If I go to Indonesia, which is a predominant Muslim country, I do the same thing. If I go to all these different countries where the religion is not Christianity, then living the gospel in your life is very important. By living, you mean showing people showing by your uh, by your actions, okay. by your love, because there is a there is a song they say. Uh, they will know you were Christians by your love. Mm. You know how you love one another. Even now in Poland, even in Europe, sometimes it's very difficult. In other European countries, it's sometimes it's very difficult to speak about Jesus. You need to be politically right, <laughs> right? So how do you evangelize the culture? Amen. Right. So that is how uh, you you we learn. So. It, when you live in a country, when you live in a country where you are oppressed, you learn different ways to share the good news. But if you live in a country like if you live in a continent like Europe, everybody has the freedom, freedom to evangelize, freedom to do whatever you want to do, freedom to say whatever you want to say. But the sad thing is that. Uh, what are my experience in Europe? My experience is that that uh, you, the the Christians in Europe don't realize how fortunate they are. I think so. The people in Poland don't realize how blessed they are to have this freedom. You see, so that is. Uh, you know, so that's why when, when when I hear a lot of things about this, I say, you know, you must experience what it's like being in a culture where you are not dominant religion, when you have restriction. About the New Zealand, I have a question, because mm -hmm. I heard that you were in the school uh, there. Yeah. And how the school of the uh, evangelization. evangelization looks like? Well, the school of evangelization, because I live in community there, yeah? In New Zealand, it's a community house. So four years I lived there as a missionary, and uh, we get, we have young people from all over the world coming for our school of evangelization. It's a five and a half months to six months school. When they come, the young people come together from all over the world. This, the first week of the time of coming together is a bonding time, where they come together, get to know one another. So it's a bonding time, yeah, doing things, and then of course we we have teachings so we have this community dynamics where you have teaching you have your prayer time together you have your work time together so we have different things of working people different different ministry like cooking in the kitchen mm -hmm. like cleaning like maintenance so everybody has their responsibility to mm -hmm. day to day yes community so then you experience and then you have your lecture time you have your study time and then you have the ministry time. Then after, at the end of this, 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 this school of, uh, at the end of the teachings, you go out for mission in New Zealand. Yeah, you go to different parts of New Zealand and you do missions. Then, yeah. So, and after this, after after this time of missions, you come back. You have time one week of discernment, time of prayer, to listen to God. What God is calling you to do. Is God calling you to come back to your country or is God calling you to continue this journey as a missionary? So those people who are interested to become a missionary, they will normally come back and do their formation for two years. Okay. I want to ask a question. I mean, do you have uh, le lessons maybe about yes, something? Yes, yes. So after this, this school of evangelization, you come back, you say, okay, I sense God is telling me to do to to do this 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 formation. So you come back and you you do the formation in the community, and in the community you have more formation teachings about spirituality, about evangelization, about different different aspects of the church. 
So yeah. two, two years. Two years. Okay. After these two years, you finish these two years, then the the community will ask you, do you want to continue to be a missionary or do you want to come back, go back home? So some people say, yeah, I would like to go back home to my community and start something there. Mm -hmm. Some people say, I would like to become a missionary. Then we invite them to take covenant with us. Then they are covenant to us. So once you take this covenant, then you can go to any mission center around the world that we have. Wow, okay. uh, you mentioned Kuala Lumpur. Yeah. And if I remember well, that's the capital city yeah. of Malaysia. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, uh, what is the difference between, between the capital city in Malaysia and the other cities, like maybe the smaller ones? Because I think that Kuala Lumpur is the probably most famous city yeah. of Malaysia and there are lots of tourists because uh, so how does it affect on living like living in Kuala Lumpur and staying in the little cities if you can tell us yeah of course uh, for me see I, I, I say I come, from, I come from Kuala Lumpur the population for Kuala Lumpur is about maybe almost two two million or 2.5 million people in the, in the city yeah when I came to New Zealand I stayed in Wellington Wellington is the capital city mm -hmm. of New Zealand. They only had 500,000 people in the whole capital. So coming from a 2 million to a 500,000, I saw the difference a lot because in, in Kuala Lumpur, everybody is rushing somewhere. Like you mm -hmm. go to Warsaw, everybody is rushing, 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 rushing. You know, so I lived 11 years in the city. My whole lifestyle was just rushing, rushing, rushing somewhere. Everybody was busy, but when I when I started to become a missionary, somehow God seems to be sending me to to different parts of uh, the the world where there was not big population. When I first came to, to Poland, I stayed in a small village called Maslonski in Czestochowa. <laughs> small, very small village. I said, God, what happened? <laughs> but. He was teaching me, okay, now it's time for you not to rush. Yeah, so, so I, so, uh, and he sent me, to, but he also sent me to different big cities like Chicago, New York, and I saw the, you know, all these big, big cities in the world. And I said, oh my goodness, I don't want to be here. No. <laughs> it's like, you know, but, but. God showed me all this, this aspect, but the, the, the difference is this, that when you are in a smaller city, and for me especially, in a, smaller, uh, in a smaller city, it's not so stressful, and then you really get to meet people. In a big city, you're always rushing. You only can, I can only have a cup of coffee with you because I have to rush. Drink coffee, okay, bye. You don't build relationship, you don't build conversation. You don't talk and you don't have friendships. When I was in, in Valentine in, in New Zealand, I had so many friends. I could invite them to come to our monastery where we live, have good conversation, have a good meal, sit down and chat, because we we're not rushing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next. I have one question now, uh, and it's about uh, that you have to give up your job, mm -hmm. give up your uh, family, apartment mm -hmm. and stuff. And how do you... Now you're living just everywhere, all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and how do you, I don't know, uh, survive? <laughs> so, because you have... People say that money don't give you happiness, but sometimes you just need money to survive. It's very true. It's very true. To survive. It's very true. I mean, I for me, that is the biggest biggest miracle of my calling as a missionary. Biggest miracle because uh, you know my background as a banker. I had, mm -hmm. I was in in control of my finances. Yeah, I was in control of how I spent my money. But when I left my job, I had nothing, no income. No income. But in this time, as growing as a missionary, God 
was showing me that he is my provider. I am a missionary now. Next year, I will be 30 years full-time missionary. I don't earn an income. In this 30 years, God has provided for my every need. Every need. Nothing more, nothing less, just enough. You know? So, I think it comes with a call when you when God calls you to become a missionary, you know He is the provider. Of course, I don't sit down at home and say, okay, God, I need money to buy some clothes now. I need money to do this. I need... No, I have to do my part. God will do His part. God always does His part. You see? Do you have stories about this yes. income from God? Maybe? Of course. When I first came to Poland, when I first came to Poland, I have many stories, but I'll share with one specific, many things. But when I first, first came to Poland, it was just after my working life and all that coming and just starting my journey, this journey, you know, really taking this journey seriously in my life. Yeah? Uh, and when I came to Poland, I had my two years formation here in Poland. And in this two years formation, I had no money. I remember in one winter, I had my jeans were all tattered and torn. And I said, Lord, I have no money to buy the jeans, you know. And I just prayed. I said, God, I trust you that you will provide. And I didn't tell anybody because, you know, I said, okay, this is between God and me. I would say, God, you called me here for a purpose, for a reason. And this is my situation. You have to provide. And in this time, of course, I, I, in this time, I had no sponsors or so. No one was sponsoring me. Because as a missionary, we are encouraged to find for sponsors. Mm -hmm. Someone to sponsor us. So in this beginning time of my journey, I had no sponsors. No one to sponsor me. So I just prayed and I next I just prayed and just did my thing as normal. You know, did my, my job, my work as a missionary and as normal, trusting that God provide. But one day when I came back to my room, I saw an envelope under my door. And when I picked up the envelope, there was money there. And there was money enough to buy jeans for myself. Yeah? So, I didn't have to ask, I didn't have to do. But later on in my journey in life, slowly I started writing to people and say, okay, this is, I'm, God is calling me. So I didn't ask people for money. What I did was, I shared with people what God is doing in the mission. So people started to read and they say, God, John, God is using you so in so many different ways. How can we support you? So people started to support me in that way. Yeah. So people started to ask because some people who wrote to me and said, John, we cannot do what you're doing. But how can we support you in your mission, God? Then they support. They say, How much uh, do you have a bank account that we can transfer some money for you? I say, okay, I have my bank account in Malaysia. If you want to transfer, you can transfer, you know. So there were people who gave me once, gave me 500 zlotis. Okay, this, but they never gave me again, you know. But there are people who continue to give me till today. Yeah, because I always do my part by letting them know this is what's happening. Or this is what I'm doing, you know. I, I send messages to them and tell them, please pray for this mission. I have now so many people in Malaysia who's praying for this mission because I tell them, I share with them what I'm doing. Before we start to record it, we talked with guys uh, about that. You have, you must have, just must have some funny stories uh, with uh, <laughs> with missions. I don't know. It can be anything, but any funny stories with your job with. With anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. When, when, okay. When we go for mission, when we go for mission as a group, you know, we have a lots of fun time. So when I was in Australia, with my community in Australia, in the group, with a group, so we had our men session because normally once a week we have women session. Women will go out together, and the guys will go out together. So my leader was a bit. He's a bit crazy. So he said, okay. 
we want to see how bonded we are as men. Okay, it was winter in Australia in, in Sydney. Okay, we say go, we go. We say, you know, let's what we're gonna do. There's a stream going by this place. We're gonna take out our shoes, take out our socks, take out everything, our jackets and all that, and we're going to stand in the water. We're gonna stand, and the water was freezing cold. And when we were in the water together, we walk in, and okay. Everybody said, oh, everybody was screaming and shouting because it was so cold. He said, no, this is our brotherhood. We have to stay this and stuff. He said, no, crazy. Hmm. And then in New Zealand, in New Zealand, they have this um, every winter, they call it the winter swim. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, I'm coming from Malaysia. <laughs> it's 34 degrees. Okay? And they are telling me, okay, we're going to have this winter swim. They asked, John, do you want to go? I said, no, no, I'm not going. No, John, you have to do it because it's a brotherhood thing. You have to do it. <laughs> okay, so I can say, so, so we got into our trunks, we got everything. So there was, the, the whole beach was full of people. And we said, so, the, so they, they, they shot the gun to say, to, to go. So everybody started running into the sea and jumping and <laughs> rushing out. And, no, I said, oh my gosh, I never experienced this. <laughs> I said, no. And then I had one friend of mine in Australia. He likes to surf. Okay. You know? He likes to surf. So he, 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 he was teaching me how to surf. So each time I stand up, I'm falling. Each time I so he said, okay, John, you, you just body surf. You just slide on the surf and just body surf. I said, okay, that's fine. So I had all this wonderful experience and I think my, my most funniest experience is here in, in, uh, in Poland. Okay. So with my community, we decided to go for a movie. Okay, but I, for me, when I first came, I didn't know Polish, and all, you know. So we went to this cinema. The toilets, normally you have Damska or... Men's yeah, men. So you know it's man or woman or you have the sign, the triangle or the... But this cinema had animals on it. <laughs> so this cinema had animals on it. So because the movie is going to start, I was in a hurry. I went to the wrong. <laughs> I went to the ladies' toilet. So I entered. I said, "Why there's no urinal?" You know, the guy said, "No you So I said, "Okay, maybe they didn't put it." I go to the to the. To the <laughs> so I went to the toilet. I went. After that, I was I was doing my my uh, shiku, and then I heard ladies coming in, and they were talking, and, and I finished, I flushed, opened the door. But, <laughs> so that was mine. <laughs> so this is some. I have a lot, but these are few of it. I have uh, something like like you. you, you. Uh, I was once in the restaurant and go to the wrong wrong, wrong restroom. And when I was uh, coming out, I saw the lady who wants to get in. So I, with a straight face, uh, you, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> a quick question round, I think, and we will start with Gresh. Quick question, quick question, quick question. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so maybe uh, another, maybe maybe a tough question for, for me. Okay. Because uh, what do you like most in Poland? Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Food or? Uh, you can pick. Okay. What do I like most in Poland? Okay. I think for me, what really struck when I first came to Poland was the hospitality of the Polish people. My first impression when I came to Poland, the first time ever I came to Poland, was the hospitality of the Polish people. You know, when you go to Polish people's house, they feed you non-stop. Yeah? And when you, say, <laughs> and if, when you go, if there's in the house, there's a babcha, she will always ask you to eat, 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 eat. eat. Yeah. Hospitality. <laughs> yeah? It's scary. It's so scary. But it's so true. So yeah. true. Yeah. You are not hungry? Eat. <laughs> <laughs> you know? 
Four. Grandma, I'm hungry. No, 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 you're not hungry. Eat. Uh, four grandma. Four grandma. <laughs> mm. Always. Yeah, so I think the hospitality, of course, I've been to many parts of Europe before coming to Poland, yeah? But I find the, the west part of, of Europe, they were a bit more very arrogant and very you know, snobbish. But I realized that uh, when coming to Poland, that the Polish people are very down to earth, very hospitable, very friendly, you know, and very welcoming. That was the difference for me, the biggest difference. Because if I've not experienced Europe, then it was different. I already experienced France, I already experienced Amsterdam, I already experienced England, different parts of Europe already, yeah? And I could see the difference. Okay. Can you come? Alright, you're first. Really? Yeah. I want to go last. Please. I wanted to go last. Please. Please. <laughs> Alright. So, you've been in Poland, uh, as I I think some couple times. Yeah. And now you're for a longer time. Yeah. Uh, and did you learn some Polish words, expressions, or stuff oh, uh, during this, uh, uh, this during this time? You heard Shiku. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course, no uh, different words. <laughs> because uh, when I first came to Poland. Uh, my community is English-speaking community, so we they were never we were never um, required to study Polish. So you pick up the normal Jankuya, you know, the Bzenia, all these sort of words you pick up, you know, just to be polite in during conversation or what, or dobra or something like that. You pick up all this, yeah. Uh, and then uh, this time, because I I was my first time in Poland was for five years. Then I was transferred to Malta, Germany, and then New Zealand. The second time I came, I lived in Poland, in Gubin, in Jalanagora, for four years. This, I mean, from four years to now, five years, I'm coming to my fifth year. Yeah? And in that community, they only speak Polish. Yeah. So I had to study Polish for two years. I had to study the grammar, wow. I had to study the... We are it's really a tough sorry. language. <laughs> no, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> every, time, every time that my personal teacher will come and teach me Polish, when she starts teaching me the grammar, when she goes back, I always have headache. I <laughs> how, how to learn this grammar, yeah? But I had a very good teacher, she always told me, John, don't worry about grammar, just speak. Yeah? yeah? As you go along, you will learn to, you know? So then I, I... And for me, it was difficult because the leader of the community was very proper in his Polish. So every time you ask me a question, when we're having a supper or lunch, he will ask me a question in Polish and I will be sweating. <laughs> <laughs> How am I going to answer him in grammatically correct Polish? <laughs> <laughs> so I always tell him, Chance, teraz nie. Ja, też. <laughs> okay, but uh, how about Polish back twisters? Have you heard any of them? Oh, I've heard many yeah. of them. I've heard many of them, but it's so difficult. <laughs> it was so difficult. Shadow is Sasha. Sasha is not a Polish name. Uh, it's a Russian <laughs> name. <laughs> I don't understand. But Polish tech twister. Tech twister. But uh, what I must tell you that uh, you don't have to worry because uh, when I go to school, I'm on a profile with where Polish is the main subject. Yeah. I have about six hours of Polish in my school. Oh my god. <laughs> 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 to be honest. I got the same. I don't understand him. <laughs> uh, to be honest, uh, when I went there first, I thought like. Yeah, that's like my, I hate maths, I hate physics, I hate all of this. I picked this and now I hate Polish, so... <laughs> uh, but what I have to tell you that when I go into my classroom, when I meet my classmates, uh, and when I hear their grammar, then I must tell you that you don't have to worry. Really? <laughs> because on profile, when, when they, they teach... Yes. Polish? Polish, uh, the Polish language is the language that even Polish people cannot speak well. Yeah. In. So <laughs> it's like, a really, uh, really tough language. There is yeah. Polish you speak uh, when you're speaking to a president, you're speaking with a friend, with yeah. a teacher, uh, and so there are different Polish. And, and it, it's, there's a Polish when you speak to the priest, so they're different. How you? Uh, 
I said, oh, cannot, cannot, cannot do this. When you speak to the police, you just take your wallet. The most, <laughs> the most easiest to speak is when you go to the shop and you speak to the bok cha. You say, Shiprasha, uh, uh, four kilogram. Uh, uh, it is really the easiest way to speak with somebody. Bok cha is the best. <laughs> That's probably one of the biggest problems of Poland because some people that are really like when they see someone that they see that they are from I don't know Malaysia yeah, yeah. if you are country, from yeah. Asia they are like wow <laughs> <laughs> yeah and they're, they're so fascinated when you speak a bit of Polish because it how about what because like. Uh, around us there are Germanic, yeah. there are people who are quite rich and they yeah. can afford to go to Malaysia yeah, or something yeah. and Polish people they can go to Baltic <laughs> and that's all probably yeah, yeah. and when they meet uh, some other culture they're like they're so really, fascinated yeah. yeah so that's quite funny to hear about yeah so the next question you always scorn yes then <laughs> <laughs> But I think the people, the Polish people in it are very kind and yes, they, yes. They, they are smiling when they are That's hearing true. Polish. That's very true. I agree, I agree. So it, even my family came in 2018, my, my whole family came to, to Poland and they were so fascinated by Poland. The people were so friendly, so hospitable, so, you know, they had very, very positive uh, uh, time here in Poland. Yeah? So. So for the last, uh, I want to um, ask you to uh, say something, of the last message you want to tell uh, our youth, maybe our mm -hmm. colleagues and uh, people who want to um, go on the missions in our country or somewhere else. What do you want to talk, to tell this, these young people? I think uh, what I want to share with these young people, if you have this desire in your heart, don't bury it. Speak to someone. Share with your with your leaders or share with your your um, spiritual director if you have or someone who you trust about this mission. Because um, when you start watering this mission, when you start watering this desire in your heart, God will open the doors for you. God will show you different things and what you can do. Yeah. Don't be afraid. I mean, I was afraid. Yes, I was afraid. But it's an initial reaction. But once you get people who guide you and walk with you, and you you know that this is what you want to do, go for it. Start with small missions. Start with weekend programs. Go for weekend programs. Okay, I help this this group to do something. I experience this something. Then slowly you move on to bigger missions. I did the same. I started with my parish. Then I started in the country. And then God brought me to the end of the year. Okay. So thank you very much. It was a pleasure to uh, hear uh, some Polish words and <laughs> hear about your, uh, your missions. And that's all you can end now. Pożegnam się po polsku, my się już będziemy żegnać, to jest na tyle na dzisiaj. Do zobaczenia za dwa tygodnie, zapewne. No to żegnam się z wami. Ja, Papa, żegna się z Wami Saku, żegna się z Wami John, żegna się z Wami Dominika, żegna się z Wami Michał. Na kawę. Dziękuję